Fighting games are known worldwide for being the ultimate pinnacle of gaming competition. You know, there's no randomness, there's nothing separating you and the opponent, it's just pure dedication and skills of the craft which determines the outcome of every single match. And a lot of people point to fighting games as a bar for pure one-on-one -on -one competition. And they say that's because there's nothing you can blame a loss on. In other genres and other games, you know, you have randomized item spawns where you're dropping in, you don't know what loot you're gonna collect in order to influence the match. You might even be in a shooting game with bad teammates. Frankie Exile here, he had 26 kills, six deaths, but still lost the game because he couldn't carry his teammates hard enough. But you might even be randomly awarded a win in certain ways. Like maybe you found a random bush to hide in and were able to hide the whole match and still get a W. He's dead. Yes! Look, I killed that one, kill that one, and then you've won it. Kill him while he's reviving, quick, go! The muffled Discord call pop-off gets me every time. But yeah, in fighting games, you can't hide in a bush for the entire round that you randomly stumbled across and potentially get a W. None of that randomness comes into play ever. Right? Well, actually, if you pay attention to the genre, there's actually a lot of randomness or RNG, random number generator, as people refer to it in the gaming community, in fighting games. It's actually present in many built-in mechanics and sometimes in some not so visible mechanics in the game as well. So I asked you guys on Twitter to share with me some of your favorite examples of RNG in fighting games, and you guys really shared a lot. I mean, like a lot, a lot, like way more than I expected to hear from. There was a lot of examples that you guys talked about. So I'm not gonna be able to cover all of these examples today in this video, but I wanted to talk about some interesting examples of RNG in fighting games. And at the end of this video, I'll give you an example that might shake your very understanding of the foundations of the genre itself. So please be sure to stick around for the end to see that example that I'm talking about. The number one most prevalent and strongest example of RNG in the FGC today is whether or not you're subscribed to the Brian F YouTube channel. Odds are 40% of you watching this video right now are not subscribed to the channel. So if you wanna make this a little bit less random, you know, a little bit more deterministic, please go ahead and consider subscribing to the channel. It really supports me and this channel. And if you enjoy the content, I would really appreciate that. With that out of the way, you know, you gotta chill for yourself here and there. Let's go ahead and talk about the real first example. You're probably tired of him by now if you've been watching this channel for an, any amount of time recently. I'm going to talk about my guy, Oro. Oro is really what got me inspired about this topic because his V Trigger 2 in Street Fighter 5 Tengu Stones is actually very influenced by randomness. If you use this V Trigger, you can either do a normal activation, which gives you three items, or a uh, the down activation, which gives you five different items. The items that are summoned are actually random. So here I actually drew up this diagram here to show off the different items and their effects. The stones are default. So the stones, they give you 10 damage for every time they connect. And as you're doing the V trigger, you'll see you press a button, the items fall behind and sort of create this pressure wave that Oro can control by doing different moves. So stones, 10 damage, no stun, and no other special properties. But you'll see all of the other items have different properties and different things that they offer. The beach ball here, Sean's basketball rather, you see it does the standard 10 damage, but it also has the added benefit of building more meter, more critical art meter whenever it connects. Blancachan here, he does the normal 10 damage, but also does an additional 15 stun. But the most important aspect of this, I think, is the V timer build. It does 10 frames of V-Timer, which is hard for me to even wrap my head up around, but in practice, essentially, you will build back a tiny amount of V-Meter every time it hits, so you're you're able to potentially use the V-Trigger for longer. Here we have the, the dinosaur, the clay dinosaur, very similar to Blancachan, but rather than doing 15 stun, it does 10 stun and does more V-Time build. It does 20 V-Timer build. So these two items in conjunction with each other can often lead to really interesting outcomes that we'll take a look at in a second here. With the details out of the way, you might be wondering how does this actually have impacts in actual gameplay and actual matches? I can show you here, I actually cooked up a few comparisons here to show you in detail exactly how this can play out in a real match. So here, first off, we have regular Tengu combo. This is all stones here, so no special property. So this is a normal combo using the stones to extend the damage and get to the corner, you know, do this combo sequence. But what happens if we do the same route, but potentially have some special items? So in this summon, we were able to get a Blancachan and a Clay Dinosaur. So remember, the Clay Dinosaur and the Blancachan both build a little bit of V-Timer every time you hit the opponent. So we, you can see here with these two routes, 
If I'm able to recognize when I start the combo that I have the extra two items to build V-Timer, I can actually do a special extension on the combo and get more damage. So you're actually able to optimize more if you're ready for the randomness of this V-Trigger. You can see this ahead of time and actually get more damage out of it if you're ready for the RNG. The other big one here is meter build. So I mentioned the basketballs actually build meter. So here I'm gonna show two different Tengu Stone conversions um, or same conversion with different items. So one of them you build a basketball, one of them you don't. And this is only with one basketball. Remember, you can get multiple of every item. So the same combo route, the top one having a basketball and the bottom one with no basketball, you can already see the subtle difference in the meter build there. But you might be saying, okay, cool. That's just a little bit of meter, Brian. Does that actually matter in a real match? Well, let's look at this example here. Let's look at this example here. How can this actually play out? So this is a pretty beefy combo. Normally this is a combo route you would go on a DP punish. Did you notice how he's left very, very close to having full super meter after already spending a bar in the beginning of the combo? That's a lot of meter build. That's actually a suspiciously large amount of meter build for one combo. What if I happen to get a basketball when I start this combo though? I think maybe your imagination could be completing the picture here. You can actually do with Oro a four bar combo if the starting situation is correct and the RNG lines up. And this is not normal for Street Fighter V. Normally you can't use EX in a combo and build super back. This is definitely an Oro specific situation when the situation lines up and you get the RNG on top of that. So a really rare situation, but it shows how RNG can actually manipulate what possibilities are available to the character depending on the circumstance. So that's gonna be it for Oro in this video, but there's another really interesting Street Fighter V RNG example I wanted to talk about, and that was Dan in Street Fighter V. By default, his fireball is just this normal heavy fireball. You see it's the blue fireball. It doesn't actually travel that far or do that much damage, but 15% of the time, the heavy fireball, or any of the fireballs rather, will give a special enhanced version of the fireball. Now, rather than doing you know very little damage and not causing a knockdown and not traveling very far, the enhanced fireball moves much faster. It actually causes a juggle state, so you can actually follow up with the combo, and it does more damage as well. This wasn't actually originally in the game when Dan first released. You might be thinking, okay, it looks, sounds like they buffed Dan to randomly have a chance to do a better combo and get more damage from his fireball. But it wasn't really done with the intention to make Dan better at random. It was actually done to counter a very specific technique that was going around. So I'm going to show off exactly what I'm talking about here. Oh, is he going to get the stun? Oh, come on. If Oh, he does. Is he going to actually get it down? The light punch starter. He does have the meter to get it going. Go. Can he actually do it? Is this going to be the Let's first time go. we see this Let's on the go. Capcom Pro Tour? So prior to the addition of the RNG element to Dan's Fireball, where 15% of the time it would knock down, Dan had a very specific infinite that he could set up if he stunned people in the corner. And RB here, being the execution monster that he is, actually managed to recreate this situation in a big CPT event, you know, the Capcom Pro Tour, an official event on the Capcom Fighter stream, showing off just how deadly Dan can be if he's able to get this stun in the corner. And in response to this, the Capcom dev team got pretty creative in nerfing Dan. So what they did, instead of adjusting the properties of this uh, infinite, they just decided to make it so that 15% of the time when you throw the fireball here, it does a red special fireball, which knocks the opponent down, essentially limiting the number of loops you can do. But once again, it's still random when that will happen. It could happen potentially on the first loop you go for, or it could potentially happen 20 reps in. So it's a pretty creative way to nerf the infinite without changing Dan's core gameplay. And I personally feel like it fits in with Dan's character. You know, Dan's always been kind of the oddball quirky character of, this, of the Street Fighter cast, and it still keeps him strong while maintaining that character. So I kind of like this way to address the infinite combo, but you know, don't be worried. It's not like you can never use this technique. So here's uh, Moruto, very strong Dan player in Japan, actually still applying this technique against Daigo in a set that they were training. Any one of these fireballs could potentially cause the knockdown. So he's just trying to push his luck to see how far he can go with this combo. And there it is. The red fireball comes out. It forces him to recognize it on the, fl the fly and end the combo. And, uh, you know, normally if that was pre-patched Dan, it would just keep going forever until Daigo ran out of health and the loop would just keep going. 
but this time he had to recognize the situation, cut the combo short, and uh, go back to regular old gameplay. So I think it's a pretty interesting addition to the Dan character and pre pretty interesting use of RNG in a fighting game design to el eliminate an unintended infinite combo. But I think that's pretty cool in general. So the next example, this one I had to do a lot of research for and a lot of people were recommending this example in that original Twitter thread. So I had to do my research for this one. I am talking, of course, about Zappa from Guilty Gear X2. I have some, some gameplay here of, of me playing against Zappa. You know, I'm a big um, Guilty Gear uh, Action Core Plus R fan. Here I am um, doing some Guilty Gear gameplay. There I am in the bottom left-hand corner, and I'm playing against Zappa. So this character is pretty interesting in general, even without the RNG elements, because it's a summon character. Zappa is possessed uh, by a ghost. I shouldn't even do air quotes. He is possessed. And what that uh, leads to in his gameplay design is he's able to do three different basic summons. And you can think of the summons as different stances. So here you can see the sword summon on the left, the ghost summon in the middle, and there's the friendly dog that he can summon. And the way these summons worked for the initial versions of the game is it was completely random. Wh whichever summon you actually got was totally random and you didn't have any influence into which summon you got. Now, this would not be a problem, but whenever you're in one of these summons, basically your gameplay, your strategy, and the available moveset that you have changes. Um, and at that time, many people considered the ghost and the dog to be very strong, but the sword was often considered the weakest summon. So this was actually the way the character played, and he's kind of balanced around this summon issue because the ghost and the dog were very strong, the sword a little bit weaker, so the RNG sort of balanced his strengths and weaknesses because you had to worry about getting a bad summon. But they started to de-randomize this a little bit once you got to Accent Core Plus R, the final version of the game, because in Plus R, they made the sword really freaking good. <laughs> So you're able to send the sword out separate from Zappa in this version of the game. And you couldn't do that previously, allowing you to harass and do mix ups and damage from almost full screen away from Zappa. So they kind of eliminated that one weakness of him randomly getting the bad summon by making every summon really good. I, I like the balancing they had prior to plus R where you kind of had to worry about getting a bad summon. Once it went to everything is good, this character became a big problem in this game. And uh, to, to many, he's still considered the best in the game to this day. For the next example, I had to talk about it a little bit. I know oh, many people watching this video won't want me to go in this direction, but I'm going to talk a bit about Smash because the Smash Brothers series is one of the biggest series that uses RNG in so many different creative ways. There's too many to really list, so I'm just gonna talk about a few that I cherry picked here. One of my favorite examples is with Peach. So Peach is a decent character in Melee, um, you know, one of the best melee players of all time, Armada, the most consistent uh, solo mained uh, Peach for the longest time. And, you know, she's decent, decent in Ultimate. But one consistent move that she had was the ability to pull a turnip from the ground, as you see in this footage, and use that as a projectile and item to zone the other characters. However, it wasn't just always a turnip. In fact, sometimes it wasn't a turnip at all. There's RNG moments where you would actually pull out maybe a sword or a bomb. And more importantly, you could also pull out a stitch face. So beyond just having the regular items um, that you could pull out, there's a percent chance that the turnip you pull has different special properties as well. So most of these, you can see the damage percent that they deal is around 2%. However, a stitch face, which deals between 30 and like 38% damage and does a lot of knockback, it can completely change the flow of the match. Because once you pull a stitch face, this could potentially snipe the opponent and kill them at their current percent. So, you know, it actually inf influences the way the game plays out. So if they happen to pull a stitch face, it, it's it's just luck, but it really actually modifies the way the match goes or they pull a bomb bomb as you see here. So it's one of those things where it's like, oh shit, I might just die at any moment now due to a, a random stitch face. The other example, which is a lot more maybe obvious to casual fans and, and casual players of the game is Mr. Game and Watch. Mr. Game and Watch has a built-in move where his side B, he does this little hammer motion and uh, it has a number above it. it got, it's a number between one and nine. And basically the effects of the hammer, are uh, they change based on the number. One generally being the weakest one, nine being the strongest. And the big one is nine, which can essentially, as you see here, 
instant kill the opponent. It does a huge amount of damage and will kill opponents at like 10% basically. So there's just a, a random percent chance that they can go for a basic combo and just kill you. So 11% up throw, nine, dead. That said, he's still a really bad character and pretty much every version of Smash, except for Ultimate from my understanding. In Melee, he's definitely a very low tier character, but he does have this small percent chance of just getting a combo that kills you at very low percent, which I think is very funny. He's very funny to watch in this game. You know, we've talked mostly about interesting examples of RNG and how they kind of enhance the playing experience and rely on players being creative on the fly to recognize these situations. There is a dark side to RNG in fighting games, and I think this one caused the biggest split in the Smash community ever. This is tripping in Brawl. Tripping in Brawl is a mechanic that I can't defend at all. I think this is a horrible mechanic and it feels purely anti-competitive. So in Brawl, there's a 1% chance that you will trip when you start a dash and you just essentially trip, you fall down. It's like getting knocked down for no reason. And there's a 1.25% chance of tripping if you're doing a run and you turn around. So th this can actually cause you to lose tournament matches. I think Brawl is actually a cool game overall at high level. It has a lot of balancing issues and other issues, but tripping is one part I can't get into. The fact that you could just randomly be punished and potentially lose over a mechanic that neither player has any control over. It doesn't take any skill to punish someone for tripping. It doesn't take any skill to avoid tripping. It's just pure randomness for the sake of randomness. Um, it's definitely the dark side of RNG in fighting games. And hopefully we see none of this ever again. My next example, like I mentioned in the beginning, this one is actually at the core of the FGC. Many people think that fighting games, you know, they're purely competitive, no randomness whatsoever. But I feel like this example sets the foundation of the FGC and proves that the fighting game genre from its inception is built with at least a touch of randomness. I'm talking, of course, about the grandfather of it all, Street Fighter 2. Street Fighter 2 is a random game. I don't know how else to put it, but when doing research for this video, I was trying to get a nice concise summary of, of this game's randomness, and it was very difficult to get the, the basics down because almost every mechanic in this game is random. Here's the highlights I was able to parse apart from all these different sources. Damage in this game for every move fluctuates between certain assigned ranges. But even once those uh, that value is determined in the assigned fluctuation, it can fluctuate further based on many other factors of the current game state. So there's multiple levels of randomness applied to just the damage. Dizzy is almost entirely random in this game. So the amount of stun you need to be afflicted with to be stunned is random. And the amount of stun moves inflict is also random. So it's really hard to predict when a dizzy will happen because it's just random on both ends. <laughs> Another big one, there is no throw teching in this game. What happens if two players throw each other at the same time? It's random. We don't know who wins. <laughs> the game literally has to pick a winner at random at that moment for who's going to actually get the throw. So someone will be thrown, but you can't determine who that will be. But to be honest, that's kind of how Street Fighter V command grabs work. It's two people command grab at the same time. Um, there's some hidden sauce underneath the game engine that determines it. So Street Fighter 2 and Street Fighter 5 are not so different in that regard, but there's a big difference between a randomly selected winner of a regular throw, which everyone has access to, and uh, two command grabs colliding at the same time, which is much more rare to happen. So that said, Street Fighter 2, the foundation of the fighting game genre as a whole, ton of randomness involved. With all that in mind, RNG in fighting games, it's often used as like an insult for other genres, that other genres have all these random elements in it, which can make games less competitive and kind of give players of less skill a chance against competitive players. However, I really think that RNG when implemented in the proper way, can really add a lot of spice and a lot of skill and player expression into the mix. When I brought up the examples, examples with Oro, I generally feel like Oro's RNG is very well implemented to reward players for situational awareness. You aren't generally punished for having any bad RNG with Oro and his Tengu stones. If you get the default stones, you do your basic combo. But if you are a well-experienced player and you put in a lot of work in lab time, if you see the V timer building options, you can optimize with new combo routes that a regular player won't know what to go for. 
So people who aren't experienced won't be punished for bad RNG, but players who have more experience can self-express themselves more and separate themselves from other players by taking advantage of good RNG. So RNG in fighting games, I think it has a home in fighting games. In fact, three out of the five season five DLC characters in Street Fighter V, the last season, had RNG. Dan, Rose, I didn't mention her, but her V skill one has RNG on the card she pulls, and Oro. So it kind of hints to me that there might be more RNG elements explicitly baked into Street Fighter games in the future. Maybe we'll see a bit more of that in Street Fighter 6. That's all I have for this video, guys. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe to the channel. Maybe leave a like and definitely leave a comment and let me know other examples of RNG and fighting games that you guys know about. I got a lot on that Twitter thread and it was really interesting to read through. So I'd like to hear more examples that you guys know about in games that you enjoy. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.